I'm Katie Masaurus. I am the sec uh, Senior Security Strategist Lead with Microsoft Security Response Center. Uh, the Microsoft Security Response Center is responsible for our second Tuesday of the month, which we all know and love. Um, and I run a team that is responsible for security community outreach and strategy at Microsoft. So what that means is I think of new programs and new ways to interact with the security community, including the hackers, security researchers, et cetera. So what we're going to talk about today is uh, I have a guided tour for you. Um, the, the title, actually, when I was thinking about the title, uh, somebody actually did really try to get along with vendors and um, on your behalf. And, and uh, I'm one of those people who tried really hard. So I'm going to actually give you the redux of what it is that I've found and what I've discovered as what works best in terms of dealing with vendors, um, give you an idea of what vendors actually want, um, and how to work out what's in it for you in sort of a mutually agreeable way. Um, I know a lot of you are interested in making some legitimate cash. There are plenty of ways to make illegitimate cash in this industry. We will not be covering those topics. I'm sure there are people in the audience and uh, outside this room who can educate you on, on those other methods. Um, and then I'm going to tell you about some ISO standards that I've been working on in the past five years or so that I've been at Microsoft. And uh, this is actually a really interesting area as it applies to you. Because even though these ISO standards only apply to vendors, a lot of discussion over the years has been about, um, you know, in the disclosure, in the disclosure to and fro between researchers and vendors, who is really holding vendors responsible for their end of the deal. Um, so I'm going to actually talk about some ISO standards that are going to be published next year and how that may affect you in your dealings with vendors who seek to be compliant with these standards. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to make it a little interesting and fun for you because. Uh, like I said, um, ISO standards are, are a pretty dry topic. And I've found myself surprisingly involved with them over the past five years. And I can hopefully provide that translation layer for you as, as to how it applies to you. OK, so who am I in a little more detail? I joined Microsoft uh, in April 2007. I run the community outreach team. As Roberto was mentioning, one of the things my team does is a conference at Microsoft called Blue Hat. How many of you heard of Blue Hat? Okay. Three of you have heard of Blue Hat. So Blue Hat is essentially a way for uh, Microsoft security engineers and executives to have the hackers and researchers come to Microsoft campus and educate, entertain, bewilder, frighten, um, you know, and hopefully give some insight into current and emerging threats so that we can actually make our products better. So that's what the Blue Hat conference is all about. Um, I believe the first one was in 2005. And it was started by Windows Snyder when she was still at Microsoft as a way to bring those hackers into, into the collective and have that positive influence um, on the security of our products. The other thing that my team is responsible for is something called Microsoft Vulnerability Research, or MSVR. And that's a program that I founded in 2008. And that is a way for internal security researchers at Microsoft who find vulnerabilities in third-party products as a way for them to get those vulnerabilities fixed when they send them out to uh, other vendors. So as a result of that program, we've had hundreds of vulnerabilities um, resolved and fixed over the past several years. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about, about that and how it applies here um, a little bit later in the presentation. So the policymaker part of my history, uh, as I was mentioning, is kind of an interesting, it's an interesting development. Because if you had told me a decade ago, one, that I'd be working at Microsoft at this point, and two, that I'd be an editor of an international standard, I would have piped your suggestion to dev null and forgotten about it. Um, but it has proven to be an interesting lever by which um, you know, I've been personally able to, to help you know, hopefully elevate some of the security responsiveness of all vendors, not just the vendor that I, that I work for right now. So it's been an interesting time. Um, before security, I, I dabbled in molecular biology in a past life, so ask me about that during the break. OK, so why would you even try to get along with vendors? I assume everybody in this audience is at least curious. So you know, perhaps this is, not, this is not a motivating factor for you. But you know, there are actually a lot of legitimate opportunities if you do make a little bit of effort in terms of getting along with vendors. And everybody's got their different motivations. Some people are really interested in money. We're going to cover that in a little more detail in this presentation. Some people are interested in you know, upping their reputation, getting famous. And some people are interested in influence or power. Um, and 
as an individual researcher going, you know, bringing your, your ideas and your vulnerability reports to a major vendor, that can seem pretty daunting. Um, and I'm just going to talk about some of the ways in which you can build your influence if you're playing nicely with vendors, if that's something that is interesting to you. Um, and also, you know what? Life's too short. We really, I think that a lot of people can get along uh, a lot better if they actually just kind of try to operate with a little bit of common sense and courtesy on both sides, obviously. Okay. So let's kind of talk about a brief history of disclosure. Um, how many of you remember Rainforest Puppies RF policy? Okay, so there are a few of you who have been in the industry for a long time. Um, so that, that was a researcher basically saying, this is how I plan to disclose vulnerabilities when I report them to a vendor. So, you know, essentially the, I'll let you know, I'll give you details, I'll help you with reproing the issue. Um, you know, but in exchange, I expect you, the vendor, to to act in a reasonable manner and try to fix the vulnerability as soon as reasonably possible. So that was, you know, kind of the gist of that. Um, the term responsible in terms of how it applied to disclosure, um, it's a morally loaded term, you know, that term responsible. There's moral judgments involved in that term. And what I've heard from people who were um, around at the, at the time talking about it, there's some, there's some disputes about where that term originated, but Suffice it to say, I think it did probably come from the vendor or the, you know, vendor or government community originally. Um, and they put that term, you know, in terms of vulnerability disclosure as an attempt to say uh, what they really wanted was private disclosure until the vendor or whomever had a chance to fix it. That's what they really meant. Instead, they kind of put this moral judgment term in front of it. So, Meanwhile, um, there was a group of vendors um, that formed the Organization for Internet Safety, or OIS, and uh, around 2004 or so, they came out with um, a bunch of these vendors had an agreement on how they would perform disclosure and what they expected in terms of, uh, you know, cooperation with the research community and how they would act um, in accordance with that. And then in the U.S., there was something called the NIAC Guide, which is the National Infrastructure Advisory Council. Um, and that went into talking about all the different roles in disclosure from the finder of the vulnerability to possibly an intermediary coordinator to the vendor responsible for fixing it and all the different ways that those roles, uh, that those roles would interact and the expectations um, of how to deal with those roles. So those came out, you know, sort of in the early 2000s. Um, and that NIAC guide was designed to inform the President of the United States on how to protect national critical infrastructure um, in terms of uh, vulnerability reporting from, from the research community. So fast forward then, a couple years later, um, in ISO land, I can just give you a quick brief, um, the, the stages of an ISO standard begin with something called a study period. So these, and that's to determine whether or not a particular topic deserves to be an ISO standard. Now, I obviously wasn't with Microsoft or involved with ISO at the time that this became, that this was in its study period, but ISO study period on a standard for responsible disclosure, and that was what it was called back then, started in November 2006. Now, had I been involved um, at that time, I probably would have just said, why would you try to standardize something that no one's been able to really standardize. Everybody has their own, you know, vendors have their own disclosure policies, researchers have their own disclosure policies, coordination centers have their own, and there's some overlap, but, you know, why would you try to standardize this? Furthermore, I would have pointed out the error in the ways of a standards organization trying to dictate how hackers react or act at all. Um, so, needless to say, I wasn't there at the time to stop this from happening. So. When I became uh, involved with it in, I believe, late 2007, some of those questions, you know, were certainly raised by me and some other subject matter experts um, in the ISO community as to why this was even being considered for a standard. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about the evolution of that particular standard a little later in the presentation. But um, further along the timeline of disclosure, um, and certainly in terms of my experience with disclosure, so Jake Coons from the Open Security Foundation um, suggested the term coordinated to me as a replacement for the term responsible. This was at, outside of a, a, a presentation I gave at RSA in 2010. Um, I thought that sounded incredibly reasonable, so what I did was I brought this to the editor of the ISO standard uh, on responsible disclosure, 
um, I brought this idea to him and I actually invited some security community members to have a talk with him about um, the fact that this, this term really did need to be replaced. Now in ISO land, it's kind of, it, it's, it's a strange thing. Um, when you actually get a, a standard approved as a new work item, is what, what it's called, um, the title of it and the scope of it are what the national bodies have approved. So in order to change the title and you know, potentially change the scope, um, this would have perhaps required uh, a lot of work you know, on the part of the people in ISO just because of the sort of the bureaucracy of how that works. Um, so they wouldn't replace the term um, responsible with the term coordinated. Uh, they ended up just dropping the term responsible. So that actually happened at, at the ISO meeting in April of 2010. So now the standard as it stands is called vulnerability disclosure. No coordinated, no responsible, no moral judgments and all that stuff. Um, so fast forward a couple more months, Microsoft uh, decided to adopt the term coordinated vulnerability disclosure or CVD for what we essentially termed as, as you know, responsible disclosure. There were a few differences though when we, when we went ahead and talked about CVD um, as it applies to Microsoft. Um, one was, you know, we wanted to make sure that the researchers understood that any level of coordination was welcome. You know, I, I think a lot of researchers thought if you weren't willing to wait all the way until, you know, the, the patch was out before you disclosed your details, that, you know, I think a lot of researchers erroneously thought that it was all, all or nothing. You know, either coordinate all the way or don't coordinate at all and just drop zero day. So one of the things that, that we were really emphasizing with coordinated vulnerable disclosure when we made that change was the fact that we actually really want a, any level of coordination. And um, once we made that announcement, a few researchers, you know, kind of raised their hands and said, oh, well, I was working on this thing and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't really going to tell you about it. It'll probably be ready in a couple of weeks. Here's some details about what, you know, what we're working on right now. That couple of weeks actually does make a huge difference to a vendor. So in terms of, you know, when you're thinking about whether or not you want to coordinate with a vendor, essentially all of them want as much information and as much lead time as possible. So as, as much as you can give them, they'll appreciate it. Um, let's see. So we, we announced that we were going to change what we called disclosure and some, some nuances about how we were going to um, deal with the security research community around that. And then, and then in April of 2011, we actually released a process um, that we follow in terms of coordinated vulnerable disclosure. And that was the first time that Microsoft had ever hosted its own disclosure policy um, or process on its own site. Previously, uh, the only things that we had had on our site was the finder acknowledgement policy. So basically, what conditions you know, a finder would have to meet in order to receive credit in one of our bulletins or advisories. Um, for vendors, it's a, very, uh, it's a very individual choice. Some vendors, you know, will give, will give credits no matter what method of disclosure is used. Um, some vendors will give credit in certain instances and thanks in other instances. And, you know, vendors like Microsoft prefer to give thanks when uh, the issue is coordinated all the way until a patch is released, and then the researcher and Microsoft can kind of go out with the same type of message. So vendors vary on, you know, on their, their credit there. Um, the reason we, we actually housed our own process and we had to announce our own process was because we were preparing to start releasing security advisories on third-party products uh, for the first time in Microsoft history. So that was the accompanying factor that drove our, uh, our release of, the, of our formal process. What was also unique about this is that um, not a lot of vendors actually function, uh, formally function in the capacity of finder, coordinator, and vendor. Most vendors just function in the capacity of vendor. You know, you, you find a vuln in our product, you report it to us, and we kind of act in that role as vendor. Well, because we had this uh, Microsoft Vulnerability Research Program going on since 2008, we actually were finders ourselves, and we were coordinators ourselves. Um, one of the functions of MSVR is, in fact, to coordinate in multi-vendor issues. Um, or blended threat type scenarios where you're taking uh, lower severity vulnerabilities with one or more vendors in order to, you know, mix it up in a blender and, and create some kind of a, a critical security issue. So anyway, we really had to, we really had to clarify this not just for our users, our customers, but we really wanted to clarify it um, for other vendors um, in, in terms of how they could expect to deal with us. So. Um, 
what's in the future in terms of disclosure? Well, you know, if you, if you consider the, you know, around 1999 as sort of the big bang of, of disclosure policies, and this disclosure policy universe has been expanding, you know, since then, um, perhaps there is going to be a collapse in that universe to, you know, one or a couple of disclosure standards, at least in terms of vendors. Now, as I was saying earlier, um, one of the flaws in the original ISO proposal for vulnerability disclosure was that it actually was uh, making, making assumptions and assertions as to how these other roles in disclosure should behave, um, which was a very backwards idea, you know, considering, I don't know if, if you guys know any hackers who are ISO compliant or feel like they want to be, but I had never met any before. Um, <laughs> so, so what this, uh, so one of the, one of the things that we worked on um, when I became involved was scoping that ISO standard down to affect vendors only and essentially mention the other roles in terms of, you know, how a vendor needs to deal with these other roles in disclosure, uh, mentions the finders, mentions the coordinators, but it's really focused at what vendors need to do in order to properly respond to vulnerabilities. So when is this thing going to come out and what is it going to look like? We'll, we'll get into that. Um, after we talk about some of the uh, cash options um, that I had mentioned earlier. Um, right now, it's scheduled to be published sometime around the fall of 2013. Now, that all depends on how the voting goes. Um, actually, the week after next, I'm going to be in Rome at the ISO standards meeting. Um, so we'll, we'll have a session then. We'll see how some voting goes in between that session and the session in the spring. And then uh, if all goes... Um, sort of according to progressive plan, then you could actually expect to see this out and live in the fall of 2013. It may take a little bit longer. Now, um, if you look back at the timeline, this thing started in 2006, and the fact that it's going to finally emerge in 2013 should kind of be an indication of, uh, of how, much, how much contention there was you know, in coming up with something that was reasonable and legitimate and, ha and was as technically accurate as an ISO standard could be. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, we'll see if it comes out in 2013. It will come out probably shortly thereafter, if not 2013. Okay, so now I'm gonna, so that was vuln disclosure in general, um, in terms of history. Let's see how we're doing with time, yeah. So a lot of these disclosure policies, historically, really we're talking about what we call box product security, um, vulnerability discovery, and, and coordination. So really that means, you know, things like you've got an application, you as a security researcher have an application that you have installed locally, you're doing all your security testing on your copy only, you're not messing with live production servers, you're not messing with online services, and, um, you know, essentially this is what most of these things were designed to, to deal with in terms of coordination. Something else that happens in our world is that we have tons of online services, and online services, as we all know, you know, any kind of web services, web vulns, those, those are legitimate issues, they need to be corrected, um, and in fact, there are a number of laws that govern in various countries how researchers, um, you know, how they should interact in terms of what is legal and what is not. Um, what's significant about vendors' involvement here is that Vendors themselves, um, you know, this hasn't really been, this hasn't really been too tested um, in terms of uh, a third party maybe wanting, wanting to pursue legal action against a, a researcher um, for online services stuff, but most vendors, major vendors, have some sort of policy, at least now, to provide some level of amnesty or, or um, you know, goodwill towards researchers who report vulnerabilities to them privately for online services, even though technically in that country it may be against the law to have been doing that research in the first place. So long story short, back in July of 2007, Microsoft was the first major vendor to ever put it in writing on their website to say that actually if you're kind enough to find a vulnerability in some of our online services and report it to us privately um, and give us a chance to fix it, that of course, we're not going to pursue legal action against you. Um, PayPal followed shortly thereafter, and I point out the difference here because it is significant, and it underlines the fact that you do need to check with an individual vendor before you kind of start, start testing. PayPal had followed very shortly, but the big difference in their, um, their sort of 
legal amnesty declaration was it excluded any vulnerabilities that were brokered via third party, um, third party, you know, vuln brokers. So, like a ZDI submitted, you know, vulnerability to them actually wouldn't be exempt from potential legal action. You'd have to ask PayPal as to why, you know, they had that distinction. Um, from from Microsoft's perspective, it didn't. As long as the issue was private until we could fix it, we really didn't care if it came from a vuln broker or through, you know, through a coordinator, uh, you know, a, a coordination center. Um, or from the finder themselves. Really, the, the important part was give it to us privately, give us a chance to fix it, and so we saw no need to limit um, you know, the sources of that information. So more recently, you know, we've seen in the news uh, um, you know, similar policies coming out from Google, Facebook, et cetera, um, pledging some sort of amnesty with a few caveats, right? You'd see different rules in there saying, please don't DOS us, you know, things like that. Um, when you're doing your security testing, um, please don't, please do your best to avoid violating uh, the privacy of our users, um, et cetera, because the reason for those, for those clauses, well, one, the DOS, the DOS issue is, should be pretty obvious, but, um, but the reason for the uh, second, you know, qualifiers that some of these vendors have on their websites is really because uh, the vendors themselves are subject to notification laws when privacy issues are, are, or when there is a breach of privacy on one of their services. So, ideally, you know, what a vendor wants in this situation, I'm kind of giving you this mind meld of what the vendor really means by this stuff. What the vendor wants is they want, they definitely want to know about the vulnerability. They would rather not have to perform a privacy breach notification to their customers as a result of you reporting the vulnerability. So, you know, uh, I have to give a little disclaimer here, you know, as in this isn't legal advice by any means, but a good idea for you to do is, um, you know, if you are going to be testing some online services of a vendor is, number one, check with your local laws, and then those local laws, um, that intersection between those local laws and what the vendor's stated policy actually is, is your sweet spot. Um, another good idea is, uh, you know, if you're, creating test accounts, um, perhaps do your testing against two test accounts that you own as opposed to, you know, sort of randomly seeking out um, information from other legitimate users in the service. So these are just some, I mean, this may seem like common sense, but you would be surprised at how many researchers kind of come to us and they found this great vuln and there's, there's literally, you know, a privacy breach embedded in that and that creates additional work, additional hardship for the vendor um, that maybe perhaps could have been avoided if the researcher just took the extra time to make one other test account. So little things like this actually make a big difference. Um, okay, so are there any questions so far on the history of disclosure and some of the online services nuances? Okay. All right, so what's in it for you? Okay, pre-2012 world, um, I kind of categorize researcher motivations as around compensation, recognition, and what I call the pursuit of intellectual happiness, essentially solving the problems that are hard to solve. Um, before 2012, you know, the, the ways that you could make some kind of cash, you know, would be traditional pen testing, you could sell it to a vuln broker or somebody else, um, you could collect bug bounties from the vendors who offered them recognition-wise. Well, the biggest way to be recognized in the security uh, industry is, is dropping zero day before 2012, right? Um, winning the Pondone contest, which was, uh, which was active before 2012, and also getting some credit in a bulletin or an advisory from the vendor. And then finally, pursuit of intellectual happiness, this hard problem solving. Some of the ways in which, you know, the fulfillment of this motivation uh, some of the ways in which I'd seen this motivation fulfilled were in technique sharing with peers. Occasionally, you'd see some cross-pollination of ideas with product engineers at the vendor company, um, and access to elites, so either elites in the security community or elites uh, within you know, the, the target vendor company, because some people really, really value that influence level, right? And one of the things that, that the Blue Hat conference that we have back in Redmond really gives some of those researchers is uh, an ability to interact directly with the people who are building the products and making security decisions on the products that, that those researchers are breaking. So, um, let's see. So, let's talk about the Volney economy in very high-level terms. 
if you think about it in terms of white market, gray market, and black market, um, essentially what we're looking at is the primary motivations for uh, the vulnerabilities intended use tends to be the differentiator here. So, you know, in the white market, you could, you know, there's vendor bug bounties, there are brokers like ZDI, iDefense, et cetera, who will share vulnerabilities with vendors um, at no cost, at, or the brokers who share vulnerabilities with vendors at no cost. Um, and the price ranges, you know, are from fairly low to, um, you know, in the Ponium contest, up to $60,000. In the gray market, though the primary purpose for, uh, for acquiring vulnerabilities in the gray market, it could be used for defense. Um, I've seen some of the vuln brokers who um, buy vulnerabilities from the community but don't choose to share with the vendors for free. Um, they do claim some defensive, you know, applications of their work as well as, as the offensive applications of their work. Um, and the prices, you know, are certainly going to be greater than $20,000 um, on average for those types of vulnerabilities. Finally, the black market is, uh, you know, primarily the buyers are governments, organized crime, et cetera. The information, the vulnerability information is pretty much solely used for offensive purposes. Um, that is the primary use. And, you know, we've seen prices reported. I'm sure there are people at this conference who could give you the current market prices for just about anything. Um, but the primary thing here to keep in mind is the fact that the white market does not try to compete with the gray or black markets, um, at least not now. Um, and if you think about it, that, that sort of makes sense, considering uh, the gray and black markets probably have access to uh, quite a bit more, uh, closer to unlimited funding um, than the white market players would have. Okay, so how does this affect uh, Microsoft in particular? The reason why um, we took a look at this, this issue and we looked at, well, our finders who report issues to us are they reporting primarily directly to us, or are they reporting um, through vulnerability brokers? And if you actually look, um, so the red there is uh, the, the issues that are dropped as full disclosure. Um, the light green, which is the next one down, are the vulnerability brokered cases. So these are the ones that we received from, uh, you know, say a ZDI or an iDefense. Um, and then the large darker green is actually the issues that are reported directly to Microsoft from the research community. So this data may look surprising to you. You know, if, if you're thinking that researchers are primarily motivated by money, uh, maybe some research, researchers are, but the ones who tend to report vulnerabilities in Microsoft products, um, you know, the ones who report tend to, to actually come to us directly at a great rate. So over 90%, actually, of the security researchers who choose to report vulnerabilities privately at all um, choose to report directly to us, even though there's, there are monetary uh, things available. So at Microsoft, we definitely respect the right of researchers to earn a living. We want to help that cause you know, in various ways. I'm going to talk about one of the ways that we decided to uh, give the researchers some cash compensation. And if they do sell vulns, you know, we're just hoping that they go for the white market so that we can get a chance to fix things. Okay, so this is what Microsoft decided to do. Um, how many of you heard about the Blue Hat Prize? Okay, so the Blue Hat Prize was the first ever um, challenge to the security community for a defense solution with a very large prize. When I was thinking about this issue internally at Microsoft, I was thinking, you know, what can we do in terms of presenting a, a hard problem for the security research community, stimulate that, you know, uh, pursuit of intellectual happiness, and how can we make the reward, you know, fairly significant? So we ran this contest. We looked for, um, you know, new runtime mitigations that uh, would be capable of preventing some of the open problems in exploitation right now that currently defeat uh, mitigation. So things like uh, a solution or proposed solution to mitigate return-oriented programming. And as it happened, all three of the top winning entries were mitigations against return-oriented programming. So um, this is how much money we paid out. So as far as uh, providing a cash incentive for researchers to look at the defense side of the security equation um, and having some kind of incentive that worked with what Microsoft is really invested in, which is making our platform as a whole much more secure and trying to eliminate entire classes of vulnerabilities, eliminate or mitigate entire classes of vulnerabilities, 
this made sense to us in terms of uh, you know, how we might structure a reward program. So the other major thing here um, that I want to emphasize is that it was important to us that the intellectual property of the solutions, all of them, all of the entries, retained, uh, or the intellectual property was retained by the original inventor. So by entering the contest, they granted us a license to use it, to use their technology. But in fact, if they wanted to you know, use that technology on other platforms, et cetera, et cetera, you know, no problem. The IP remains the property of that, of that um, individual. Okay, so why is it that vendors are really interested in uh, investing in security at all? Um, I mean, all vendors who care about security are basically interested in uh, increasing the cost to the attacker and decreasing the cost to us as defenders. So how do, how do we kind of go about doing that? So we as vendors increase our investment in finding vulnerabilities ourselves. Um, obviously, all the investments in the security development lifecycle that Microsoft's made over the years, other companies have made significant investments in this area, um, where you focus on automation to try and scale and, uh, you know, and remove entire classes of vulnerabilities via automation if you can. Other ways that vendors are investing is they're trying to increase the attacker's investment in order uh, for the attacker to write the exploit. So if you build enough mitigations in, it actually makes it a lot harder, and we've seen this um, you know, time and again with the later versions of, of most operating systems, including ours, um, making, making the exploits really hard to write reliably. So it's very, very, it, it just becomes much more expensive um, for the attacker. And then finally, um, increasing our response capabilities um, to shrink that window, should a vulnerability be discovered, shrink that window of exposure um, and decrease the uh, opportunity for the attacker to recover their investment you know, in finding the vuln and weaponizing it. Okay, so, let's see how we're doing here. All right, I wanna make sure to leave some time for questions at the end. Um, so now, in the post-2012 world, uh, what do we have in terms of meeting some of these motivations and fulfillment? Well, we've got the Blue Hat Prize in all categories, um, and the Ponium Contest as well, you know, has come into being in the last year. But, you know, essentially, the, one of the things that, you know, you'll want to consider as a security researcher is what of these motivations are the most important to you? And what are the things that you're, you know, kind of prepared to do in terms of cooperation and coordination in order to get to your ultimate goal, you know? Um, after a while, you know, security researchers, they tend to grow up, have families, you know, mortgages, things like that. And if you're thinking about your career in longer terms, think about, you know, maybe at the beginning of your career you're more interested in money. Maybe you're interested in building out, you know, your, your recognition and fame. Or maybe you're more interested in pursuing, you know, sort of the challenge and the problem itself. Okay, now I'm going to switch gears and talk about what vendors are going to be held responsible for in terms of these ISO standards that I've been alluding to. Okay, so everybody knows what uh, a click is in high school, right? It's a, you know, one group that's fairly, um, fairly closed off from the other groups, right? So ISO, I, I could have titled the slide everything I needed to know about ISO I learned in high school. Um, but there's essentially two camps in ISO, and I'm telling you this because it matters in terms of how the, how the ISO standard on vuln disclosure ended up uh, evolving. There are the subject matter experts, so people like myself who've got real world experience um, in the area in question, but subject matter experts may not have experience in dealing with the world of ISO. Then there are the ISO experts. Um, there are experts in actually creating standards. There are some people in SC27, which is the, the, um, the, the group that this, these standards fall under, that have been a part of the ISO uh, standards body for 20 years. Um, most of them mean well. Some of them are quite politically motivated and who knows what else. What's interesting about it is that subject matter expertise is not required by ISO in order to become an editor of a standard. So what that means is if you decide, for example, um, that you want to standardize on something like responsible disclosure, uh, you don't actually have needed to have any kind of experience in disclosure in any role. 
either as a finder or coordinator or vendor. And that's exactly what happened when, um, when that standard was proposed. It was a non-subject matter expert who thought this would be a good idea. Um, so how is it like high school? Well, pretty much you've got the nerds and the jocks. And uh, for, you know, for my experience in this world, it was very much like, you know, the, uh, the ISO experts are willing to copy your homework, you know, and then as soon as you're not sort of useful for their purposes, they will stuff you into a locker to be discovered by the janitor hours later. Um, okay, so let's get down to the two standards. Basically, these standards overlap. Um, they are related. They evolved uh, out of the, the first one. Um, and in fact, some of the process issues that are covered in the second one were originally a subsection of the first one. Um, there were a lot of issues with the first one. There continue to be a lot of issues with the first one, which I can tell you about during the break. But essentially, these are what the two standards cover. The vulnerability disclosure standard, which is 29147, dictates how vendors should deal with vulnerability reports from external finders. I'll go into each of these in a little more detail in the next two slides. And then the standard on vulnerability handling processes is how vendors should investigate, triage, and resolve all potential vulnerabilities. And that's whether it was discovered externally or discovered via the vendor's own internal testing or security development lifecycle processes. So in terms of what vendors are being held accountable to, um, I would actually say that the second one is probably going to have much more of a significant impact on your experience in dealing with a vendor than, in fact, the first one. Okay, so let's dive in a little bit, uh, a little bit deeper. The disclosure standard roughly covers that vendors should have a clear way to receive vulnerability reports. How many of you have searched in vain for some kind of security contact at a vendor? Many, yes, okay. So that alone will actually help, given that there's no standard way to have a front door to receive these things. Um, the other bit is that vendors should acknowledge that they received the vulnerability reports within one week. That number of how long it takes to acknowledge, yes, I did receive your report, that number has changed a, you know, a lot over the past five and a half years within that standard. I believe the one week um, one is the one that is going to stick, but I've seen things like 24 hours, 48 hours, 30, you know, 72 hours, two weeks, you know, all manner of these things, but I think one week is probably gonna stick there. Um, vendors should coordinate with finders. This seems like a simple no-brainer. However, a lot of vendors, if you have noticed, um, will not communicate with the finder at all once they receive the vulnerability report. And in fact, sometimes the finders just find out that the vuln was fixed or maybe not fixed um, by you know, reading the, the release notes you know, of the next version and testing their vuln against the next version. And there's no actual communication back to the finder. So this will kind of help with, with those types of issues. Um, and then finally, the advisories that the vendors, or advisories or bulletins that the vendors issue. How many of you have seen um, so-called security advisories coming from vendors that literally don't say anything at all, anything meaningful? Yeah, a lot of you, right? So one of the ways in which this disclosure standard may actually help is that it does give guidance to vendors on useful information to include in an advisory. At the bare minimum, include as many affected products as the vendor knows about, right? Um, include the impact or the severity of the issue if the vulnerability is successfully exploited. And then include for the user or the customer how it is that you're going to protect yourself. So at a very basic level, this all seems like remedial vendor response, right? And it is, but the funny thing is not all vendors, including some major vendors, not all vendors even follow this basic amount. Okay, so in the vulnerability handling standard, this is the one that dictates the internal processes of a vendor. This is basically organized uh, such that it's informing vendors via the standard that vendors should have a process to handle, uh, should have a process and should have organizational support and structures um, to perform vulnerability investigation and remediation. This also seems like a no-brainer, however, a lot of vendors, um, they don't really come up with any kind of organizational structure or they don't come up with any kind of processes internally to fix vulns or it's part of you know, their regular bug fixing process 
And that doesn't take into consideration a lot of the security concerns around fixing bugs that happen to have security implications. So it's really important, um, you know, in terms of the standard of letting vendors know that if you are to comply with the standard, you need to actually have a specific process for dealing with security bugs in particular. Um, and you need to have some kind of org structure to support dealing with that. Second, this one is uh, probably the one that's nearest and dearest to my heart, is that vendors should perform some kind of root cause analysis. What actually caused the vulnerability? This is amazing that we're, you know, we're in 2012 and this is the kind of thing that actually a lot of vendors don't do correctly. Um, in, my, in my years of reporting vulnerabilities to major vendors, um, I've actually seen vendors uh, patch the, the one vector that we reported via our proof of concept. How many of you have seen that before? Right? Yes. So the fact that you know, a vendor doesn't have the capability of, of perhaps understanding the root cause of their own vulnerabilities is something that is a, you know, that's a problem they're going to have to work on long term. What will perhaps help, help guide them towards that end is the fact that it's going to be in this standard. Um, oh, one thing I should actually clarify is uh, not all vendors, not 100% of vendors um, are going to have to comply with these ISO standards. Essentially, the way ISO standard compliance works is uh, an organization decides whether or not they are going to be compliant, and part of that decision process is business, right? So if you're an organization that wants to do business with a government, the government will say, these are the following ISO standards and various other standards that you, uh, my vendor, need to comply with before you can be my vendor, right? So major vendors are going to be affected by this a lot more than midsize or, you know, mom and pop dev shops. So if you're kind of thinking about it in terms of, well, how is, you know, a single developer open source project going to provide organizational infrastructure to support vulnerability response, how is that possible? Well they're not really going to need to be compliant unless they want to do business with a government that requires compliance. So that's just a little background on how, you know, how is it that vendors are actually going to be held accountable to this. It'll be the major vendors who want to do business with organizations or governments that require compliance. Um, so the other thing that's included in the standard is that vendors should weigh the various options for remediation and adjust for real world risk factors. It doesn't give a prescriptive guide on, you know, if this, then this, you know, in terms of how a vendor should react, but it does provide a lot of context in this, in this document about, you know, balancing the need for speed with the need for providing a comprehensive update. So it'll say things, uh, you know, in their considerations being, um, you know, is their exploit code already public, you know, and that maybe will speed you up as opposed to um, doing all of this testing and looking for, you know, looking for variants, looking for um, uh, the same or similar code and vulnerabilities in different, uh, you know, other product lines that you own as a vendor. So Ideally, you want to do the most thorough investigation and remediation as possible as a vendor. And that's definitely what this standard supports. However, it does also give that idea of taking into consideration the relative risk and the prioritization. Um, and then finally, uh, this standard talks about vendors trying to coordinate with other vendors, um, especially in the case of multi-vendor issues. And multi-vendor issues, you know, there are, there are issues where you know, let's say the vulnerability is found in a, uh, a, a protocol or the vulnerability issue is found, um, you know, in, uh, in some common library. Um, that, that can end up being, you know, essentially a supply chain issue. So there is a mention in, in this handling standard about trying to coordinate upstream and downstream if you're a vendor who's somewhere in the software uh, supply chain. So, okay, how is this actually going to affect your life? Because I do want to just go for another five minutes before I open it up for questions. Um, ideally, the uh, disclosure standard is going to tell vendors, you know, some basic stuff that will make it a lot easier for you as a security researcher to, one, find the front door to report a vulnerability, and two, um, to actually have those advisories be more useful when they come out. The vuln handling standard, as I said, I think it's actually going to help raise the baseline level 
of security investigation and remediation that vendors do. And again, like I said, it'll only affect vendors who want to do business in certain countries or certain areas that require compliance with this standard. But it's a lever and it can help move some parts of the disclosure world. Okay, so just to wrap it up, um, vuln disclosure doesn't need to be as painful for you or the vendor. Um, you, when in doubt, coordinate as much as possible. Um, most vendors who care about security want to hear from you. They definitely want to hear from you, and they want to hear from you as early as you want to give them a heads up. For online services vulnerability reporting, it's a tricky area. There are some legal gray areas that you have to be able to navigate in order to um, you know, keep yourself safe and, and make the risk worthwhile for you. Um, so first and foremost, check the laws in your country. Next, check the policy of your intended research target. And you know, there is an intersection of the above. Um, or you could always try just asking for permission. That usually helps uh, you know, in terms of, uh, even if the, the intended research target doesn't have a stated policy, if you've asked for permission and they've granted it, well, that in most cases will literally get you out of jail um, in, the, in the first bullet there in terms of uh, running afoul of the law. For some cash opportunities, you know, there's always pen testing, um, which if you're interested in doing that for a vendor, building that strong relationship with the vendor and providing, you know, cooperation and, and details and all that stuff really help in building that relationship. There are the white market brokers, there are some vendor bounties out there, there are exploit contests like the Ponium one and Pona own, and there's of course the Blue Hat Prize for security defense if you want some legitimate money. And then finally, these ISO standards that are going to reach fruition um, at some point next year or very shortly thereafter will actually be there to hold some vendors accountable for some of the disclosure interactions with the researcher community, and more importantly, some of the investigation that they need to do in order to truly remediate these vulnerabilities that are being reported or are being discovered internally. I think, you know, I think we've, we've all had at least one experience with a vendor where they literally just patched you know, the one vector that we sent to them. And um, not only is that, you know, that certainly wasn't you know, the researcher's intent, um, in terms of the vendor ending up zero-daying themselves um, because they didn't really fix the issue. Um, but, you know, it certainly hurts the vendor as well. So I think that with these processes in place and with these standards in place, it should increase your predictability in dealing with vendors who claim compliance with these. Um, it can also help you uh, have some tools that vendors may be more prone to listen to, considering it's coming out of this ISO standards body, um, if a vendor doesn't claim compliance, you could always point them to these standards saying, these are the ISO standards on how you're actually supposed to do this, vendor. Um, so it provides you as a researcher some of these tools that you can use to help leverage um, the right outcomes for you, um, for the community, and, and for the vendors themselves if they know what's good for them. All right. So with that, uh, more information on the Blue Hat Prize, go to bluehatprize.com, some various links up here. I'm Katie Moe on Twitter. And I want to open up the floor for any questions in the last 10 minutes. Yes. Um, OK, one of your slides um, mentioned about the full disclosure and then uh, coordinated disclosure. Um, mm -hmm. do, can you please um, switch to that slide? I know which one you're talking about. This yeah, one. yeah, sure. Um, so what do you mean by full disclosure? Drop the zero case? day. Uh, does that include malware that uses um, undisclosed vulnerabilities? Does that include malware what? That uses undisclosed vulnerabilities? That uses undisclosed vulnerabilities, yes. Yeah, so if malware uses zero day and that, that zero day is... So do you see day. a trend of people dropping uh, undisclosed vulnerabilities on billing lists or do you see more... Um, more undisclosed vulnerabilities being dropped through malware? Well, it's still a relatively low percentage um, overall. Um, we've seen some, you know, some notable examples in the past couple of years of, of malware using, using some O-days. Um, and that had, been, that had fallen out of vogue for a while. Um, but then we, we started seeing you know, some state-sponsored actors using some, some malware that, that does leverage some zero days. So, it's hard to tell where the trend is going right now, but for a while it was, it was very much not in fashion to essentially blow your zero day 
on you know, mass malware or even targeted, semi-targeted malware. And uh, one last question is that uh, I noticed that the ISO addresses you know, vendors coordinating and communicating with the reporter, but um, what does Microsoft do as far as um, um, you know, making sure that vulnerabilities get addressed on time or as fast as they can and, rather, uh, and not sitting on the vulnerability for a couple of years before, you know, because one of, one of the things that I saw uh, why reporters decided to uh, break out, uh, break from the coordinated uh, vulnerability disclosures because vendors tend to sit on vulnerabilities for a long, long time. And that actually causes them to, you know, to get into some trouble. Yeah. Okay, so what was the question? <laughs> um, the question is that uh, what does Microsoft do to address a um, you know, um, situation where they, they may tend to sit on a vulnerability for a long time because they may not have an idea to fix the problem or they may think that the, fixing the problem uh, could result in a high risk of you know, introducing more regression in their software. So right. what, yeah, what, what does Microsoft you know, do in this case? Um, so we actually have a, we have a white paper out that talks about the different, the different um, stages of our investigation and how much relative time those stages take. So if you think about it in terms of um, you know, looking at the vulnerability itself and coding up the, the actual security fix, that, doesn't take, that usually doesn't take a lot of time. It's really the compatibility testing stage for us as a, as a platform provider. And, and we've got hundreds of products. There's language localizations. There's a huge test matrix that we have to, um, that we have to comply with. Because in the early days, you may recall, there wasn't a, the, the tendency for, for vendors was to try and fix it as quickly as humanly possible. And then a lot of, uh, a lot of the result of that was having to issue um, fixes to the fixes. So what Microsoft's process has evolved into is trying to do that balance between timeliness and comprehensiveness. And we have a whole white paper that actually talks about those different stages um, and what that means. But, I mean, for an example, in my past life, when I was a Linux developer and rolling the patches myself, my test phase was, does it compile on my Linux box? Does it compile on the guy's Linux box next to me? All right, roll it into our RPM, stick it on the FTP server, and then let your users test it for you for the rest of it, right? That was that, was that world. Microsoft has a very different uh, responsibility level in terms of our customers. They don't want to roll out a patch to fix the last patch. So we have to balance that out, and I can point you to the white paper um, a little bit later. I have a question. Yes. Supposing I am a security researcher, and uh -huh. I'm coming from some stupid European country, <laughs> no names, where, for example, the simple possession of an exploiting tool, whether it be a public tool or my own tool, it's a crime. How am I supposed to handle the situation, for example, with Microsoft? So. You're saying you're a security researcher who's in a country where it makes the exploit tools illegal. Yeah. And you want Microsoft to bail you out of jail? What's the question? No, 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 no. <laughs> I, want to, I want to communicate with, uh, with Microsoft and I want to handle uh, the, the, the exploit over. Right. And, uh, and to Microsoft to get uh, a better OS, for example. How should I behave? How should you behave in that situation? Well, I mean, it's a matter of how much personal risk you want to assume in your own country and whether or not you're going to be able to um, deal with the consequences if, if your own country decides that, that you violated their laws. I mean, certainly Microsoft would love to get you know, the vulnerability information from you, but not if that means that you're going to be you know, putting yourself at legal risk. That's a larger problem that you know, I think, especially if perhaps some of these standards you know, are widely adopted, that if it becomes obvious that this is actually helping the overall security of vendors' products, that maybe there might be ways in which later down the line that, that those countries may overturn some of those legislations. But I'm not a lobbyist, so I don't know exactly how that would happen in your country. It doesn't, yeah. But actually, my question was a suggestion, because uh, most of the time laws are written by politicians mm -hmm. who know nothing about security. Mm -hmm. Germany had a taste of it, for example. Doesn't work? Okay. Probably Microsoft, uh, Microsoft should lobby, actually. Should uh, address to politicians saying, hey, look, these laws are not really helping. Actually, they, are, uh, they have a counter effect because they're security research. So 
I'm very, personally, I'm very interested in this. Um, you know, if my work in the standards wraps up, because it is a lot of grueling work, honestly, um, being, being a nerd in that festival of jocks, um, you know, maybe there, there are ways that, that I myself could help out in that area. So I'm personally interested in this. Um, and miraculously enough, the ISO community seems to have accepted me, uh, perhaps, you know, perhaps a, in a future iteration of my career at Microsoft, I might be able to help influence some of those legislature, legislators as well. Because I know it's really frustrating, right? When you're we're looking at the politicians and literally, uh, you know, I don't know how, how clueless some of the older ones are, you know, in this country or in Europe and everything, but in the US, a lot of them are, you know, they're just not informed in terms of technology. We hear things like, the internet is a series of tubes. I mean, if you heard that quote from one of, one of the US lawmakers, this is a very frustrating issue. Um, and it's on this, you know, it's a similar frustration that I've experienced on the micro level with ISO in terms that there are subject matter experts who may or may not be listened to. Um, and then there are the career politicians, you know, who are, who are versed in the ways that laws are made, you know. And so I think, you know, if possible, I would like to apply some of my skills in that area. Good luck. All right, thank you. <laughs> Any other, let's see, I think we have time for one more question. Or time to thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Katie.